Hey team, Mike here at Dr. 40 Fitness and dr40fitness.ca. Uh, I got a quick question posted to me today and uh, I'll share it with you in a second. It was on OMAD. Someone said to me, Mike, how can we never talk about alternate day fasting in OMAD? And I thought to myself, you know something? I've never done a video on this. What a great question. I'm going to cover that today, why I personally don't do OMAD or by extension, alternate day fasting. I'll give you my reasoning, my logic. I went and looked up a couple of the reasons as far as scientific you know, studies go. And I'm going to cover four of them today that hopefully if you do OMAD, you'll reconsider. And it's from a purely protein and muscle sparing perspective. Let's get into it. But before I do that, if this is your first time to my channel or you haven't yet, please do subscribe. Punch the subscribe button, you know, like the video, share the video, subscribe to the video, do something with the video, will you? Let's get after it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with the position paper. I'm gonna show it to you right here. It's called the Nutrition and Athletic Performance Paper in the article, Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise. This position paper, uh, when it comes to protein needs, I jumped right to this section. So it had a whole lot of topics on physiology and nutrition, but when it came to protein needs, it says that current data suggests a dietary protein intake to support metabolic adaptation, repair, remodeling, and for protein turnover ranges from 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram. So what that tells me is I weigh 85 kilograms. So for you American folks, if you cut it in half, because it is roughly half, and I'll show the equation here, it's 0.45 pounds per kilogram. That would mean roughly 0.6 to one gram per pound. But at 85 kilograms up here in Canada and the rest of the world, um, that would mean that I need somewhere right around between well, 1.2 at 85 kilograms is almost a bang on 100 grams and two kilograms would be about 170. So this is saying that generally speaking for people who just a just regular bit of exercise, not sedentary, you could be on the low end at the 1.2 or 0.6 grams per pound, but as much as two indicated for short period, uh, periods during intensified training or during a calorie restricted diet, right? Reducing energy intake. Isn't that interesting? So that's kind of like the, the guideline there for, as it mentions, to support metabolic adaptation, repair, remodeling, and protein turnover. However, it then went on to say in cases of energy restriction or sudden inactivity, as, a, as it occurs as a result of energy, elevated protein, protein on the high end of two grams per kilogram, again, one gram per pound or higher, when, here's the key phrase, and this is why I don't do OMAD, when spread over the day may be advantageous in preventing muscle loss or what's called fat free mass right of which muscle is a component so i thought to myself what does that mean spread over the day so this is where it gets really interesting as i look at this next graph and it says as far as like per meal per session remember this is a position paper this is not a study we're not into those yet i'm going to show you three of them this translates into a recommended protein intake, and the title of this, I should show it was on a per meal basis, of 0.25 to 0.3 grams per kilo, or call it 0.1 to 0.15 grams per pound. And then it translates that into roughly 15 to 25, 15 on the low end, 25 on the high end, grams of protein across typical athletic size bodies, so the guidelines need to be fine tuned for athletes at extreme ends. Higher Dorton, and this is the part, remember, 15 to 25 grams per meal. You can decide if you're on the low end or the high end, but 15 grams to 25 grams per meal seems to be the norm. Higher doses, greater than 40, catch that, gram dietary protein, again, we're talking about per meal, have not been shown to further augment muscle protein synthesis and may only be prudent for the largest athletes or during weight loss. My question for you is, how much protein can you assimilate per meal to maximize MPS, muscle protein synthesis, while minimizing muscle loss. Let's have a look. That is the purpose of the next three studies I'm going to show you. And by the time I'm done, you're going to go, yeah, that, that's why Mike, Coach Mike doesn't do OMAD. And for that matter, why he doesn't do alternate day fasting. Alternate, I am a fan of fasting. And just so you know, just to digress real quick, I'm partial to food-free Mondays. So I will IF most days, and I'm 16-8 or 18-6, depending on the circumstances of the day. I play that one by ear. But it's either 16-8 or 18-6. But as of Sunday dinner, when I finish dinner with the family, I tend not to eat again until Tuesday at noon. So I like to start every week with a 40-hour fast, but my 40-hour fast is no meals. Yes, it's got some artificial sweeteners. I like me a Diet Coke. That's zero carb, zero calorie. That, to me, is fasting all day. You can argue all you want on the health-centric benefits. Don't argue the keto-centric or the fasting-centric. It's zero carbs, zero calorie, and not one study, as I show in many videos, on aspartame, stevia, monk, and erythritol don't show any insulin response. So you can go 
peddle that crap somewhere else, that rhetoric and that dogma about the insulin response. Show me one study on stevia, monk, erythritol, or aspartame showing fasters, fasters, having an insulin response. I give in. I'll give you props for it. Just send me one study. Because to date in 2020, not one study shows fasters having an insulin response. Don't tell me about the cephalic response. Don't tell me about sweet taste. It's all bullshit. It's all rhetoric and dogma, and it's been blown out of proportion. Not one study proves it. So let's get into the studies. I am going to show you this one here was the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition from 09, already a decade old. And the title was Ingested Protein Dose Response of Muscle and Albumin Protein, Protein Synthesis, After Resistance Exercise in Young Men. The purpose of the study was that these men and this participants in this study, they came in and you can see right above where I've highlighted an intense bout of leg-based resistance exercises and then on these five different occasions they either had nothing no protein no egg protein they're using egg albumin here in case you're wondering egg protein then five grams 10 grams 20 grams or 40 grams of egg protein protein synthesis and whole body leucine oxidization were measured over four hours after exercise so i bet you're wondering you should be wondering right now which of these had the best response Muscle protein synthesis displayed a dose response to dietary protein ingestion and was maximally stimulated at 20 grams. Oh my God, I did not expect it. I would have thought 40 grams. Even in the last study, the position paper nailed it. Nailed it when they said 15 to 25, 20, right dead center in the middle. Well, what happened to the other 20? I bet you're wondering what happened to the other 20. Okay, I was curious, what happened to the other 20 grams of protein? Turns out it just gets used as fuel, converted to uh, via gluconeogenesis, right, into glucose in the liver and stored to keep our, our blood level, our blood sugar normalized, or it gets excreted as waste via ammonia, ammonia and um, urea. Unbelievable, nitrogenous waste. Next, we move on to the Journal of Physiology from 2013. This is May of 2013, so eight years ago. Timing and distribution of protein teen ingestion during prolonged recovery from resistance exercise alters myofibrillar protein synthesis. In a long way, I'll just get to it. Okay, we're going to talk about dose-dependent nature of muscle protein synthesis. 24 healthy trained males were assigned to three groups and undertook this resistance training, so a bout of resistance training, followed by 80 grams of whey over the next 12 hours. Okay, so over the next 12 hours, 80 grams of whey. Now, the question was, how'd they get the whey? One group got 10 grams, eight doses, right? So every 90 minutes, you can see it says every hour and a half. So the, their 80 grams was broken into eight 10 gram servings every 90 minutes. They called that group the pulse group because it pulsed every 90 minutes, I guess. The next group, four times 20 grams. So 80 time, divided by four, 20 grams per, per serving every three hours and called that the intermittent group. And lastly, Two groups, or one group, got two servings of 40 grams. Now, every six hours, by the way. The bolus group. So pulse, intermittent, bolus. Pulse every 90 minutes, intermittent every three hours, and bolus every six hours, and an associated number of servings out of the 80 grams. Now, prior to the last, right, to the last study, if I said to you, which of these three groups do you think got the best muscle protein synthesis? I don't know about you, but I would have guessed the 240s. I would have thought the two doses of 40, the bolus group, would have had the best muscle protein synthesis just based on pure volume. I mean, just gorging on protein two times 40. Well, you know the answer as well as I do from the previous study where it maxed out at 20. All ingestion protocols increased muscle protein synthesis above rest. So above the zero group who got none during the next 12 hours of recovery. But intermittent elicited, which is the every three hours, right? 20 grams every three hours, elicited greater muscle protein synthesis than pulse and bolus. And notice the amounts, 31% more than pulse and 48% more than bolus. Unbelievable. Uh, who would have guessed? All right. 20 grams of whey protein consumed every three hours was superior to either pulse or bolus feeding patterns for stimulating muscle protein synthesis throughout the day. This study provides novel information on the effect of modulating the distribution of protein intake on anabolic responses in skeletal muscle and has the potential to maximize outcomes of resistance training for attaining peak muscle mass. Last one. This is in the journal Nutrition from 2014. Dietary protein distribution positively influences 24-hour muscle protein synthesis in healthy adults. 
All right, now this is last one is most relevant to OMAD. Now I think what you're getting so far from the previous two and the position paper that I showed you first is that if you max out your muscle protein synthesis at roughly 20 grams and now you're OMAD and now you're like me and let's say for example, let's never mind the fact that I like to get 150 or 175 grams of protein a day. Let's just say it's like every one of you and I'm trying to get 80, 90, 100 grams of protein and I now jump into OMAD, then you have to try to get 80, 90, 100 grams of protein into you in one hour, in one meal, okay? I don't know anybody who can. I jump into, into social media forums every day and I don't know anybody who can. If you can, God bless you. However, what did you just learn from these studies? Muscle protein synthesis peaks at 20, maybe 25 if you're lucky, grams of protein. Beyond that, you do nothing but fuel gluconeogenesis to maintain a whole bunch of glucose in your liver to maintain your level, homeostatic level of, of blood glucose, or you, via nitrogenous waste, via urea and ammonia, you pee out the rest, right? So the idea, uh, let's just get to this last study and I'll prove it to you. Dietary protein distribution positively influences 24-hour muscle protein synthesis. We measure changes in muscle protein synthesis in response to iso energetic, so the same amount of calories, and isonitrogenous diets, same amount of protein, with protein at breakfast, lunch, and dinner distributed, distributed both evenly and unevenly. So the same amount, here's what I want you to get, the same amount of food, same amount of calories, same amount of protein. The question was at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, would they be broken up evenly or not, or skewed? Let's have a look at this. First group, evenly, you can see 31 and a half, 29.9 and 32.7 plus or minus one and a half grams. So they tried to aim for the 90 grams that were that was the iso protein amount for the day. So it's always 90 grams. They tried to do it as evenly as possible. Let's just call that an average of 30, right? You can tell they did aim for 30, give or take a gram, right? Obviously tough to do with food, right? So about 30, 30 and 30 at breakfast, lunch and dinner. Let's compare that now to that's the even group to the skew group. And this is probably what most people consider to be their typical, I, let's call this a typical standard American diet, a standard Western way of eating. 11, 10.7, but let's call that 11 grams at breakfast, 16 grams at lunch, and 63, or roughly 63, give or take three, so 60 to 66 at dinner, respectively. Now already, based on what I've shared with you, what do you think happened? Which one do you think of these two pro, pro uh, uh, pro, uh, Programs, regimens, wow, I've stumbled through that. Which one of these two protocols is where I was going, um, do you think had the best mot muscle protein synthesis? Well, obviously, if you know that muscle protein synthesis now kind of maxes out at 20 grams per meal, then obviously the 10 and the 16 didn't maximize nothing, but the even group maximized all three opportunities. Well, I mean, it's a given, right? The 24-hour mixed muscle protein synthesis rate was 25% higher in the even group versus the skewed group. 25% higher. I, listen, listen, make no mistake. Muscle protein synthesis is not this huge phenomenal thing. It's a very slow, very long, very patient taxing and testing protocol to add muscle. But I just as soon have the extra 25%. Thank you very much for my efforts. So... Let's see what the conclusion was. The consumption of a moderate amount of protein at each meal stimulated 24 hour muscle protein synthesis more effectively than skewing toward the evening meal, AKA OMAD, right? Just picture this skew at being zero, zero, cause you're fasting. And then 100%, whatever that value is at dinner. Okay, now listen, if your goal isn't to put on just gobs of muscle, this not be relevant to you, but it is because what they don't show in any of these studies is that your ability to save muscle is also the exact same protocol applies. The exact same principles are the same. Anybody who thinks that when you fast, you don't give up a little bit of muscle is naive. Yes, fasting, thanks to IGF and growth hormone, uh, make no mistake, they're muscle sparing. The term is muscle sparing. Have you heard that term? That ketones, Ketosis, fasting, growth hormone, IGF-1, they're all muscle sparing. None of them are muscle growing, right? You can't, no, 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 don't think for a second that growth hormone is muscle growing. I mean, that's a, that's a, a poorly named hormone. It is responsible for muscle maintenance, not for muscle growth. Muscle protein synthesis requires activation by resistance training, which is why every one of these studies includes resistance training, and then adequate protein to maintain your positive nitrogen balance to feed the fuel of the fire to grow muscle. 
Now, make no mistake, growth hormone and IGF are muscle sparing. They are not muscle proof. You have never ever heard anybody call fasting or ketosis or ketones or GH or IGF. You've never ever, ever heard them called muscle proof. And the difference is that while, and I, the studies, I got, I'll got link to a couple of videos down below on fasting versus losing muscle. And studies all show that if you go on a standard caloric deficit diet, like Weight Watchers or The Zone or Jenny Craig or one of those, uh, you probably give up somewhere around 25, maybe even as much as 30% of your weight loss is muscle loss. Okay, 25%. Now, every study on those in ketosis and those who fast shows it somewhere in the six to eight, maybe in as high as 10% range, right? Just thankfully so much less, hence the term muscle sparing, right? But this protocol applies the same way. If you don't wanna and you shouldn't wanna give up any muscle, not an ounce of it, then it behooves us to get more protein in more often. I'm not talking about more meals, I'm talking about more protein. So I personally don't do OMAD anymore. Okay, I, could, I found that, listen, I, not only could I, was I, did I lose muscle, but I couldn't gain any. Now, my preference then is to drop back to, like I said, 16.8 and 18.6. I find that way I can get two or three servings of 25 grams of protein in. And while I no longer aim for 175, I do aim for three or four times a day of getting this minimum amount, it seems, of about 20, maybe 25 grams to make sure I'm maximizing muscle protein synthesis. So never mind that I don't give up any. If there's a chance I can add a few more ounces in 2020, I want it. I'm taking it. I like having some good size on me at 51, but I want a little bit more. And that means OMAD is out of the question. Hey, listen, folks, on that note, I hope this information, on the, this, these three studies I showed you kind of prove that getting all your protein in one lump sum in a bolus manner is counterproductive. All right, don't uh, do what you want. Obviously, I'm not coming to your house and twisting your arm, but I hope that when you see this, you'll realize that anything more than 25 grams of protein at one time is wasted. Don't do that, right? Don't go out and have yourself two pounds of wings and think I'm eating 75 grams of protein. God bless, I'm good. I just made up for the fact I just fasted the whole day. Or do this, make sure you break it up. If you are going to do OMAD, I'm gonna put another link down below to how we mix up our regimens. We mix up our diet, we mix up our IF, we take diet breaks. Your metabolism will thank you. And this is one of those places where if, you're in, if you insist on doing OMAD, please don't do it every day. Right? I think I just proved to you it's counterproductive. If I didn't do a good job of that and you're not walking away going, man, I can't do OMAD every day, I'm giving up muscle, then I did a poor job in this video. You could easily do 16 and 8, or sorry, an 18 and 6, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then do OMAD Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. That might be about the only way I'm going to recommend you do OMAD because while you only get one meal on your Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, at least on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you can fit in three and do your best to maximize your muscle protein synthesis on those days in between where you rob yourself and only give yourself one chance of getting adequate protein in. Hey, listen, as always, the best comments turn into videos like this one. So please, if you disagree with anything I've said, or you think I left out some pertinent detail or some science that I didn't cover here, man, I'd sure love a comment to that effect. Throw that down in the comment below. I'll definitely give you credit in the video like I like to do, but I hope you got some information on this that may just be a key takeaway that could explain why if A, you're not putting on any, any muscle despite resistance training, or B, you may have lost some, okay, then you, maybe OMAD isn't right for you either. But on that note, I really appreciate your time. Don't forget to hit the like button, like the video, share the video, subscribe to the video, and on that note, see you in the next one.